It looks like we're recording now. So I'm going to talk about yes, hypnosis. Tra tra Sorry, Tracy is recording, so she's. I think she's got you taken care of now. Thanks. Great, thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. So I'm going to talk about hypnosis and the relief of pain. And this is something that's been around for a long time in the pain field. And I think it's kind of an area that we don't discuss too often here in the Center for Integrative Pain Management. So I, I wanted to get a discussion going about it. And I have some experience with hypnosis. When I was in medical school, I did a month long elective in hypnotherapy uh, at the, the Medical College of Ohio in Toledo. And then in my residency at the University of Maryland, I did an elective in hypnosis and hypnotherapy uh, with Vic Fitterman, who was a social worker on the faculty there. So I, I have some experience with this. It wasn't necessarily focused on pain particularly, but I've done lots of reading about it. And so I thought I'd share with you some, some thoughts about hypnosis and the relief of pain. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Does anybody know who this gentleman is leading this talk here about uh, hypnosis, this old painting here? Anybody know who that is? Well, that's Jean-Martin Charcot. And Charcot was a neurologist and he died in 1893. So we're talking about an area of medical practice that's been around for a long time. And uh, there's lots of people still focusing on this and looking at the benefits of hypnosis and the relief of pain and other areas of psychotherapy and uh, and also medical management. So I just wanted you to know that this has been around for a very long time. And then this person with their hand submerged in, in a bucket of ice water is something called the cold presser test. And so uh, what we know with the cold presser test is the more time in cold water, the more pain that's experienced. And so the colder the water and the longer the period of time submerged, the more painful it gets. And so uh, this is how we do morphine equivalent. So if, I'm sure you're familiar with the opiate potencies, but the way that they determine that is by the cold presser test. And so different uh, opiates have different potencies related to how long someone can hold their hand submerged in cold water. And here's somebody who's under hypnosis who has their hand submerged in a bucket of cold water. And so you can test the cold, the, the effectiveness of hypnosis with the cold presser test. And then here's an article uh, this is from, I forget what year this is, it's in my references, but uh, shows that hypnosis and distraction differ in their effects on cold presser pain. And what they found is that highly hypnotizable individuals showed significantly greater pain relief versus those who uh, were just distracted or those who were in waking relaxation. And those who had been hypnotized and had high hypnotizability also showed significantly greater high theta activity on their EEG. And so there's something going on neurologically, physiologically in the brain that uh, enables these people to not be responsive to the pain stimulus of a cold presser test. So I'm going to talk about my learning objectives now. So first of all, we'll talk about the historic inclusion of hypnosis in mainstream medicine. We'll talk about trance and its induction. We'll talk about experiential learning. We'll talk about the mechanisms of hypnotic pain relief. We'll talk about something called direct and indirect suggestion. We'll talk about self-hypnosis, which is the key to chronic pain control. We'll talk about the theoretical basis for hypnosis and the relief of pain. We'll briefly discuss the empirical support. And then we'll talk about training and competence and hypnosis techniques, have some conclusions and think about the implications, and then talk about some wild future directions in hypnosis and the relief of pain. So hypnosis entered mainstream medicine in the United States in the 1950s. And so it was endorsed by the American Medical Association in the late 50s. 
and the British Medical Association endorsed the use of hypnosis as an anesthetic in certain surgical situations in 1958. So this goes back a long ways. So what is a hypnotic trance? Well, trance is actually something that occurs naturally in people's lives, and it's a state of relaxation, absorption, and automaticity. And so we enter into light trance states, watching television or a movie, uh, driving or with certain music or dance. And you can tell because when you watch a movie, you sort of lose track of time. You know, time just disappears. Where did what's been happening? Uh, you know, you just get lost in the movie. And that's that that's a trance state. And then deep trance is a state where the person is so deep into that absorbed state that they become amnestic. They can't remember what happened and they develop something called catalepsy. Does anybody know what catalepsy is? Well, catalepsy is an immobility that hypnotic subjects can show. And so they become motionless. They get that kind of masked faces that you see in somebody who has Parkinsonism. It's just the whole body becomes immobile. And then also in deep trance, you can do something called post hypnotic suggestion. And what that means is you can make a suggestion to the individual in a deep trance that then gets enacted in their waking state later and they're amnestic for the suggestion. They don't remember that it occurred. Now the induction of hypnosis is a social experience. And the key to this is to have a solid rapport, a solid rapport with the individual. And once you have rapport, you can really get away with just about anything. And so there's, there's two kinds of induction. You have formal induction and then something called naturalistic induction. And so a formal induction, you have the induction proper where somebody you know, tells you to go deeper, deeper asleep and relax and let go and they may count. And then you have a deepening process where the person is deepened into a, a deeper and deeper state of trance. And then the suggestion is made and then the individual is awakened. So that's a formal induction. And then in naturalistic induction, the induction and suggestion verbiage that address the unconscious mind is hidden inside a longer container of ideas that preoccupy the conscious mind. So the person is talking along to the conscious mind of the other person while they're making suggestions and, and things to the unconscious mind hidden within that kind of discussion that's going on. And so suggestions are hinted at or subtly suggested. And then also in naturalistic induction, there's a process called utilization, which means that your response ready to use constructively whatever exists in the total situation the patient presents you with. And so you just kind of seize on opportunities in the story and whether anything about the patient, their body language or tone of voice or uh, the, what their shirt says or anything about the person and their total situation to use that constructively to work with them to, and it kind of is a flexibility that allows the patients to change their symptomatic states. I hope that makes sense. Now, another thing that happens with hypnosis is something called experiential learning. And so someone who's experienced with trance can share that experience naturally with another person or a group. So since I've studied hypnosis, it's a part of me. And so my tone of voice and my mannerisms and my energy can be conveyed to another person or a group of people simply because I access that state readily, it's part of me. And so they learn it experientially. And for me, that state is calm and empowered and strong and relaxed. And so what happens is people observe this happening to someone and then they interject this useful state into themselves. They interject it is what that's called. And so like if, with a role model, if you wanted to be like a role model, you interject the role model's qualities into yourself. And so this is an unconscious process that we do when we recognize something in someone else and just interject that quality into ourselves. And so people having experience with hypnosis 
can allow other people around them to interject that quality and deal with pain, actually. So relaxing naturally at a deep level and breathing more rhythmically and parasympathetic tones seem to create what we call a healing state of mind. And so uh, hypnosis is absorbed. It's often a relaxed state. It's often a state of, of kind of letting go and relaxing. So how does hypnotic pain relief work uh, in this hip state of hypnosis? And so what you're doing is using the person's own resources. And if they don't have the resources, you have to build them. And so there's three main ways that it's done. Uh, dissociation, distraction, and modifying the experience. But there's really seven different ways that you can use hypnosis in the relief of chronic pain. And so one is dissociating away from the experience or kind of withdrawing away from the experience of, of the discomfort that the person is in. And so kind of detaching from it. And another along those lines is something called distraction or distancing oneself from it. And so kind of in the getting involved in life and the joy of going all out in life, we kind of forget our pain. And then also forgetting is a resource that people have and people don't think of positive forgetting, but you actually like, for example, you forget to feel your glasses on your face or your watch on your wrist. Uh, and so if we can forget those things, really that's a resource that uh, you can forget in the same way in relation to pain on some level. And then you can modify the experience so you can change the experience of pain into a musical rhythm, for example. I'm a musician, so I think of uh, musical things. And so if you can change that experience from discomfort into a musical rhythm, it becomes less troublesome. And then you can kind of let go of the resistance. So when we're fighting against the pain, that makes the pain kind of more aggravating. And so letting go of the resistance in hypnosis can help with the relief of pain. And then also kind of what we learn from mindfulness is that a detached observation or equanimity can help with the relief of pain. And so you can access that in a trance state as well. And then lastly, you can dilute the pain experience into an expanded consciousness. And so if you think about, you know, if I add a teaspoon of salt to a glass of water, the water, you drink it, the water tastes salty. But if you add a teaspoon of salt to a gallon of water or a swimming pool of water, it's not going to taste very salty. And so we can expand consciousness uh, in a hypnotic state, and then the pain gets diluted in that kind of expanded consciousness. Now, the unconscious has abilities that we may not be aware of consciously. And so if you think about it, no one knows his potential or her capacities. So really the unconscious mind has a lot of abilities that we just don't recognize. And so how do you make suggestions in hypnosis? Well, you would think one way is with direct suggestion. But the problem with direct suggestion is you get resistance. So people may not follow a direct, a direct suggestion. But the way around that is through what's called indirect suggestion. And with indirect suggestion, you're orienting toward a concept instead of kind of directly addressing it. You orient toward it. And that bypasses defenses, and you're really speaking directly to the unconscious mind of the person. And so what you're doing is evoking something through indirect suggestion. And you can use metaphor or build the structure of a concept or even art or tasks or illusions or poems or jokes or derivatives. You, know, you might think jokes are not really appropriate for pain, but I once heard a joke, you know, they they say uh, no pain, no gain, but uh, I like no pain, no pain. And so you can you can use things like that to evoke a change in how the person experiences uh, their discomfort. And then another thing that's helpful is to pause after a suggestion to allow time for the suggestion to happen unconsciously. 
So if you make a suggestion and then you pause, it kind of impels the person to follow the suggestion because there's that vacuum where something should be happening. And then the person evolves from the inside out rather than teaching didactically. Now, one of the key things to remember in hypnosis is that a person will only do what is acceptable to the self. So you have kind of an observing ego in you, and you're not going to do something a person suggests if it's not acceptable to the self. Now, here's a, uh, a, a table, a chart showing how high hypnotizable people under hypnotic analgesia get a lot of relief of pain and a placebo has kind of almost no analgesic effect or even a negative analgesic effect whereas low hypnotizable people show very little analgesia to placebo or a or a hypnotic induction so there's something to this hypnotizability and the degree of hypnotic responsiveness is the strongest predictor of pain relief. So it's a trait, actually. So hypnotic responsiveness is a trait rather than the state of hypnosis. And so that's what's most important is hypnotic responsiveness. And so we want to build the responsiveness of the individual. And what you want to do is calm the distressing stuff down and then build desirable stuff up. And so the person takes charge of it in a clear-headed way. You know, all their issues of love, work, health, and place, and calming that distressing stuff down and building desirable stuff up. Now, what about self-hypnosis? So this is the key to how you address chronic pain. And so self-hypnosis is a learned skill set, and it, it, the person becomes no longer afraid of pain. And so pain and distress can actually be in some ways mastered. And it's really a do it yourself inside job. And so the mind is a powerful tool and it's actually possible to overcome pain and suffering without drugs. And so people have to learn kind of the people kind of aren't aware of the possibilities and don't really realize that they can learn how to do this on their own. And unfortunately, only about a quarter of chronic pain patients are able to achieve the degree of concentration necessary in self-hypnosis for lasting pain control. But 25% of patients is a pretty large population. So I, I, I kind of, you know, I argue that we should really be thinking about whether we can, you know, kind of get to the fundamental science of this and apply it to our refractory cases. Now, one thing that's important about self-hypnosis is moving from passive to active. And so people kind of get into this, I'm a passive recipient of care uh, versus being an active approach to self-care. And so that, that passive kind of recipient of medical care kind of disempowers patients. And so self-hypnosis is a way of empowering patients in the face of, of chronic pain. And so when you do that, you have an important shift about beliefs about helplessness and passivity to resourcefulness and ability to function satisfactorily, even if the pain is still present to some degree. And so satisfactory functioning mean, means being able to handle home and family responsibilities. It means that you can care for yourself and work and enjoy socializing and recreation, to sleep adequately and enjoy sex, you know, have decent quality of life. So what is the theoretical basis of hypnotherapy and the relief of pain? So patients are found to be more responsive after an induction of trance than if given suggestions without an induction. And so one of the key elements of this is that the, cl the clinician must believe in what they're doing and communicate kind of a quiet confidence to his or her patient. And I say a quiet confidence because when some when a clinician is overly confident and kind of shouting their confidence at the patient, that ushers up resistance. And so it's better to kind of be politely, you know, humbly confident. 
in what you're doing. And when you're like that, patients you know, are more receptive to the work that you're doing and are more likely to fall into kind of agreement with the process. And so you want to be careful about ushering up resistance from patients. Then what's the empirical support? Well, there's multiple studies. This has been around since the 1950s. So many studies have concluded that hypnosis is an effective treatment for both acute and chronic pain. And it has efficacy, durability, and cost effectiveness. Now, safety becomes an important issue. Uh, and what I recommend for safety is that patients find a reputable therapist rather than shopping for a particular technique. Uh, you know, the, when people can be suggested to do malevolent things or harmful things. And so you need a responsible uh, individual who's going to be working with a patient to provide safe hypno, hypno, hypnotherapy, the treatment and relief of chronic pain. And then there's been, of course, advances in the relief, relief of pain with hypnosis. Uh, when I was in my medical school elective, I even watched a video of somebody having a C-section under hypnosis. So it's possible to do surgery and address acute pain with hypnosis. And it clearly could be part of an integrated approach to the management of refractory pain. Now, what about the training and competence in hypnosis techniques? I recommend face-to-face -face training followed by direct supervision, and we have credentialing here at WVU. So I am not credentialed in hypnotherapy here. I haven't had the cases to get credentialed. I, I don't use formal hypnosis in my work with patients. I don't use deep trance. I think that, you know, it's part of me and I access that kind of relax, absorb state in myself quite easily. And patients interject it when they're present with me and feel relaxed and strong. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not inducting a deep hypnosis in somebody, a deep trance. And, uh, but I think credentialing is important. And then monitoring supervision and feedback are significantly more effective than workshop-based training alone. And maybe the future of training would be a computer-based training uh, to, to convey principles and illustrate the implementation of, implementation of strategies. And you could have short movies or clinical vignettes showing the confrontation of challenging situations and have exercises that people could do. And actually what we need is an expert panel consensus that provides guidelines for the hypnosis practitioner. All right, so what are the conclusions? With a wealth of evidence supporting its use, hypnosis is still poised to take a respectable role in interdisciplinary pain medicine. And so we've got strong theoretical and empirical support with a variety of pain conditions, all sorts of pain conditions, dental, uh, surgical, chronic pain. So all kinds of pain conditions can be addressed with hypnotherapy and self-hypnosis. And the hypnotic relief of pain may be more emotional than sensory. Uh, so uh, it helps with pain intensity, disability, and the psychological burden of pain. And so perhaps Hypnosis should be a component of all pain therapist repertoire. And maybe even we could say that all clinicians interacting therapeutically with patients experiencing pain should have some ability to make use of hypnosis in their work. Now, what about future directions? So what is the potential of experiential learning for hypnotic analgesia? So remember, experiential learning is where you, you learn from observing somebody else experiencing something, and then have, you have your own experience. So in, in medical training, we talk about see one, do one, teach one. So that's kind of the experiential learning that takes place in medical training, and you can kind of have that with hypnosis as well. And so maybe there'll be technological solutions and media, you have film and music or apps. And I think maybe the future direction of this is online coaching, which could provide greater access to care. And then if we really think off in the future, maybe we'll have artificial intelligence assistance 
who will use deep learning in order to interpret all the data from sensors that people will have and produce a quick and precise answer <coughs> to exactly what's going on, including using hypnosis. And perhaps hypnosis will take place through something called a neural link, which is a brain machine interface. And uh, Elon Musk has been working on this. I don't know if you guys are aware that there's actually uh, someone working on neural links uh, and brain machine interfaces and what the potential is of that for people. And then ideally we compute the cure of chronic pain you know, using technology and computers to figure out what the answer is to all of this. But what I would like to suggest that we think about doing is having a hypnotic analgesia education curriculum for WVU providers. So here's my references. What do you guys think? Any thoughts about this? Dr. Hersler, how often do you use hypnosis in your practice? Are you using it with a lot of our patients or? So like I was saying, it's part of me. So I, it happens with me unconsciously. You know, I, I, I've studied this for a long time, so I don't put people in a formal trance state where I'm inducting them into deep hypnosis and using post hypnotic suggestion. But it is part of me. And so when I'm listening to a patient, I can enter that absorbed, relaxed state, you know, kind of a strong and relaxed state, emotional state. And, uh, and then they can interject that by observing me or listening to my tone of voice or my body language. And, and so on some level it's happening, but it's not formal hypnosis. Do you follow what I'm saying? I do, yes. And how do you think this compares with like meditation with regard to achieving kind of a calm, you know, strong, calm state of being? I mean, it sound, I haven't done any hypnosis, but I've done some training with meditation and the outcomes not seem similar, but I, I'm kind of curious what your thoughts on how they compare. Yeah, so the, you're accessing the same thing with to like with a mindfulness med meditation. The whole process is focusing on a single thing. So you, maybe you follow the tip of your nose and the air going in and out of your nose as you're breathing. And so you become very focused on that one thing. And when you get distracted, you pull yourself back to focusing on the tip of your nose. And so with mindfulness, you get that absorbed focus state and it is great for pain. And I know Mass General Hospital has the stress, uh, what is that program called with John Kabat-Zinn? But yes, yeah, so they, they, use, they use meditation to relieve chronic pain. And it really is the same thing. And when you practice that, it becomes a trait. Just like we were saying, you know, the re hypnotic responsiveness is a trait. And so a trait means it's always with you. And that's what I'm saying. This is something that's always with me. I've explored it enough that it's just part of my life. So if I go to the dentist and they're doing a procedure on me, I kind of just enter that kind of relaxed state and uh, I don't need much pain relief medicine. They only use Novocaine or, you know, I just kind of relax into that state and, and I, I feel comfortable dealing with a fair amount of discomfort because I, I can access that state quite easily on my own. Very interesting. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Does anybody have experience with hypnosis here? Anybody been in a trance or you know looked into this at all? No. So probably the most uh, well established places in the United States is the Erickson Institute Foundation in, in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, based on Milton Erickson's uh, work. Uh, Milton Erickson is no longer living, but there's a foundation around the world, and, and the center for it is in Phoenix, Arizona, and Jeff Zeig is the leader of that foundation. And, uh, you know, it'd be great if we could have training or, you know, Maybe there's online training that you can do through that place. And then Stanford, I know uh, David Siegel is a, a very famous hypnotherapist at Stanford. And those, those are the primary people that I know. 
but it's it's all over the country and the world. So there's, there's lots of places to learn. You just want to be careful about who you select so that the person is going to be a responsible individual uh, dealing with this in a, in a responsible, mature fashion. There used to be a yearly um, course here on campus, but it hasn't happened in a while. And some of the major individuals who were excellent therapists, like a guy by the name of Marion Kafka, he's since died. And um, but anyway, it was it was very good. I went years ago. I was a total skeptic, and I was in a trance within five minutes. And so, it's um, it's really interesting. I hypnotized a few people for various reasons. Haven't done it in a long time. You're right. You have to really be careful with your metaphors so that you don't make a situation worse. But it was the only thing bad about it for us is it takes a lot of time to do it right. What do you think about the experiential learning aspect of this, Rick? Like if you can access that state on your own, do you think people pick up on your tone of voice or uh, you know, your body language if you're kind of relaxed in that state and kind of acquire it themselves? Well, to be honest, I usually assume the opposite stance and they pick that up right away. So I would assume that the opposite is true. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right, you guys, I hope this was fun I hope and interesting for you. Have a good morning, everybody.